as I share with you today's scripture lesson. As Beth told everyone during the children's message today, I am inviting you to do a slow read with me through Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. I put together a reading guide where we can read certain verses each day and meditate on them. For while this is a very short book in the Bible, it is packed, packed with insights for the living of these days. And so I invite you now to hear these words from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort in love, any sharing in the Spirit, any sympathy, complete my joy by thinking the same way, having the same love, being united and agreeing with each other. Don't do anything for selfish purposes but with humility, think of others as better than yourselves. Instead of each person watching out for their own good, watch out for what is better for others. Adopt the attitude that was in Christ Jesus. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. One of my favorite musical forms is the spiritual. And for long as I can remember, one of my favorite spirituals has been Sweet Little Jesus Boy. Do y'all know that one? I don't know exactly what it is about that spiritual that touches my heart so deeply. I like the melody but I also like the images that it calls to mind and it stirs up some deep feelings inside of me. Sweet little Jesus boy. So pretty. But the words, the more I think about them, are disturbing. The spiritual ask and says, we didn't know who you was. We didn't know t'was you in that manger. The world treats you mean, Lord, treat me mean too. But please, sir, forgive us, Lord. We didn't know t'was you. It's almost like underneath that, we can hear the implied concept that it's okay to treat ordinary people one way, but we need to treat Jesus differently. As if we treat people differently. We forget that Jesus said, when you did it unto the least of these, you did it unto me. We are called to see Christ in everyone, there are no different standards for the way we treat people. Not knowing that that baby is Jesus in the manger should not make a difference. We should still treat that baby with compassion and tenderness and love and with care. Now, I believe we all know this intellectually, but living it out becomes a challenge in our daily lives. Paul is writing to the church at Philippi, and I often think of the book of Philippians as filled with joy because he talks about joy so much, but he is writing to them because they are quarreling with one another over some disagreement, differences of opinions about things. And he talks to them about living in harmony and in unity with one another and he says that we need to have the same mind as Christ in order to live in harmony and unity with one another. We need to realize the value of each other. 
that we are all created in the image of God, treating one another, as Jesus said, as if we are treating Christ. Consider the interest of others as more important than your own. It's not about me. It's about serving one another. But what does that look like in daily life? What does that look like in daily life? We hear about the numbers of people who are homeless in this community. We hear about the people who are hungry in this community. We hear about people in other countries who are suffering. We hear about the refugees. We hear about what is going on in Ukraine. We see those numbers. But as an African proverb puts it, statistics are numbers without tears. So unless we go from the long journey of the mind to the heart, we may know the global numbers of pain and suffering and need in this world, but we won't care enough, we won't be motivated enough to do something about the needs of the world. I think that's one of the reasons that at Lutheran Theological Seminary, where Austin and I both graduated from, part of our seminary education was field education and a cross-cultural appointment. They wanted us to do mission work somewhere so that those numbers in the statistics of people in need and hurting in the community around us and globally would not just be numbers but that they would have names. Because when statistics have names, they touch our heart at a deeper level. When we know the people who are hungry, when we know the people who need better housing, when we know the people who are grieving, we are motivated to reach out with more love and compassion the particular cross-cultural ministry that I engaged in was a trip to Honduras. Honduras is the second poorest country in the world. I took that trip with the Heifer Project, where we went around and we helped people become self-sustaining, purchasing honeybees for them so that they could cultivate honey and sell it to earn money for their families. But I'll never forget one of the deepest lessons I learned on that mission trip. While we were in the Chorti village of Copan, we were sitting in an old school building. We had brought school supplies and toys and games and stuffed animals for the children in that school. And the mothers grabbed up all those boxes of things that we brought and they took them to another room instead of giving them to the children. We weren't sure why we wanted to see the joy in the children's faces of opening up the gifts that we brought them. We were told later that the mothers were going through those boxes to see what they could sell to earn money to buy food for their children. And then they would give their children the leftovers. It broke our hearts. I sat in that old school building and I looked around at the people who were gathered there, the children who studied in that school, and I noticed how dirty and broken down that school building was. I was almost afraid to touch the desk. You know how when you sit at a desk and it's sticky and it's gooey, you're just like, and I just felt myself like that. I tried to be as small as I could be and not touch anything. I saw the disease, the parasites that had infected the children. And I was sitting there going, dear Lord Jesus, I do as I listened to the stories of what they were trying to do in that village, a little baby started crying. And the mother was trying desperately to keep her baby quiet. One of my teammates 
reached out to that chore tea woman. He walked over and he instinctively reached out his hands and he took that crying baby from the mother and he cradled that baby in his arms and soothed that baby's crying. I watched as he held that tiny infant in his arms, bouncing that child gently and whispering to the baby softly to quiet the baby's tears. And I became ashamed as I watched. I became ashamed because I'd been sitting there hearing those same cries. But I was thinking so much about the dirt and the grime and the potential for disease, the dirt that was on those children's bodies and their clothes and in their hair. And yet my teammate was untouched by all of that. He saw a baby in need and a mother in distress, and he reached out. And I started to pray, dear Lord, why didn't I reach out and pick up that child? Were those children the untouchables in my mind? I was treating them like they were the lepers of the world. My teammate after the baby stopped crying, handed the baby back to the chore tea woman, and he left the room. And I automatically thought, well, he's gone to wash his hands. He's gone to get hand sanitizer because he was touching that baby. And but later that evening, he told me why he left. He didn't go to wash his hands. He left because he was crying. And he didn't want that mother to see him crying. He said the pain that he felt in seeing that little baby that was so light and had no teeth brought deep compassion to his heart. And he was questioning, where is God in the midst of this poverty and this pain? I looked at my teammate. And I said, God was right there in your presence as you reached out to that child and you showed compassion and love to a child and a mother that so many of us call untouchables. It was holy ground at that moment, my friends. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's when we're humble enough to put the needs of others before our own fears and worries, when we have the courage to reach out and be last, to not think about ourselves, but to think about others. I know there's so much pain in the world, and it's easy to turn our eyes and our ears off. There was a cartoon appearing in one of the national magazines several years ago that showed a husband and wife relaxing in their easy chairs at their home. And the husband's watching a football game on TV. The wife's busy doing a crossword puzzle. And she comes to something in the crossword puzzle that she's not sure how to answer. So she asked her husband, can you tell me what apathetic means? And the caption under the cartoon says, no, I don't know what apathetic means, and I don't care either. <laughs> and the sad thing is that because there is so much pain, it seems like we've become apathetic to so much of it. It hurts so much when we allow that journey from the head to the heart to cause our heart to hurt for the least among us. The attitude of the Christian is to be quite the opposite of apathetic. We are to be, as theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, the ones who live for others, caring and caring deeply about the needs and the concerns of our neighbors. And of course, we all know that parable of the Good Samaritan. We live it but listen again to those words that Paul wrote in verse 4. 
Instead of each person watching out for their own good, watch out for what is better for others. Watch out for what is better for others. You see, in all of our lives, there become those moments when it's clear that it's one of those it's not about me moments. Now, some people's lives are centered around those it's not about me moments. We think about firefighters. We think about police officers. I think about nurses, nursing techs who work in the hospital, meeting the needs of patients. I think about caregivers in the home who take care of the elderly and the homebound. But there are moments in each and every one of our lives when it's clear that it's not about us, when we can show love and compassion. That moment might happen in the parking lot when you see someone struggling to get their groceries in the car. It might happen at your place of work or at your school when you see someone who is lonely or someone who is being left out or bullied. Sometimes it happens in our own families or in our communities, in our neighborhoods. I read a story recently about a dear woman. She had some sort of disability that was intermittent. Some days she could hardly walk at all, but other days she could walk with a little bit of difficulty, but she could walk. And on those days when she could walk, she liked to walk in her neighborhood and down to a little pond that was in the center of her neighborhood. And she would see near that pond that just above the ridge, there were some railroad tracks. And in the springtime, she noticed that little baby turtles would sometimes get stuck in between the trussles in that railroad track. She'd make her way up that little ridge, and she'd help those little turtles get out of where they were stuck and help them move along their way. She thought, it's not much, but it's something I can do out of compassion for God's creation. I can help that little turtle that's struggling get on to a better life. She says one day when she was walking back from her journey to the pond and helping the turtles, her legs just sort of totally gave away on her and she couldn't walk the rest of the way back to her house. She sat down on the side of the road and kept trying to get up, but her legs wouldn't move. One of her neighbors happened to pass by and asked if he could help. He lifted her into his car and he drove her to her house and helped her get inside. And she wrote this about that incident. She said, I have many neighbors in my neighborhood who often see me walking and struggling as I walk. But no one has ever stopped before to ask me if I needed help along the way. Except this man. He didn't offer to pay for medical bills. He didn't come in and ask if he could fix my lunch. He didn't notice the messiness of my house and offer to clean it for me. All he did was offer me a ride and help me back into my house. But his compassion has touched me deeply. Considering the needs of others when we see them going by. I believe there are two things we all need to remember in order to live this kind of life that Christ lived, remembering that the way Christ lived was always making it his business to look out for the overlooked, to show compassion to the outcast and the downtrodden, to break the social norms, even the religious laws, for the sake of love, to heal, to save, and to serve people. And Paul says there's an unspeakable joy that comes to us when we do that. So here are two things that we need to remember to live that kind of life. And the first is to remember that people are people. People are people. 
No matter where a person lives, who a person is, or what a person does, a human being is a human being made in God's image and incredibly precious to God. One of the most disturbing and yet inspiring places that I have ever traveled to was the Holocaust Museum in the Holy Land. Leading up to that impressive memorial is a walk lined with carob trees planted by the Israelis in honor of what they consider the righteous Gentiles. Now, a righteous Gentile is one who risked his or her life to save Jews during Hitler's Holocaust in Nazi Germany. And under each tree is the name of a person or a couple who acted with compassion and mercy. Mark Trotta recalled in one of his sermons that, that one of those trees has under it the name Stephanie Berminski. Stephanie Berminski was born in Poland, and when she was 16 years old, her father died, and her mother and older brother were taken off to a labor camp to work. That left Stephanie in the family apartment to care for her six-year-old sister. After the war, it was discovered that Stephanie not only cared for her six-year-old sister in that apartment, but she also sheltered 13 Jews. She was 16 years old. She took care of her sister, but she also had compassion and took the risk of taking in 13 Jews and hiding them. In an interview, she was asked why she did it. And this is what she said. Our parents taught us not to make differences between people. They told us we all have one God. And therefore, in the future, if you can help people do it, and she concluded, I always thought if I could help somebody, I ought to try and do it. People are people and incredibly precious in God's sight. As Carl Sandburg wrote in the prologue to the family of man, the first cry of a newborn in Chicago or Zimbabwe in Amsterdam or Bangladesh has the same pitch and the same key. And all those babies are saying, I am. I have come and I belong. I am a member of the human race a member of the human family. If we want to have the courage to be last, to be humble, to have the mind of Christ, then we need to remember that all people are people. And secondly, we need to remember that pain is pain. The personal burdens that a stranger has are just as difficult to bear as our burdens the burdens that our enemies have to bear are just as difficult to bear as ours. Pain is no respecter of race or economic or religious affiliations. All those barriers we erect, pain overcomes. Tears of grief in the eyes of a Palestinian father are just as painful as the tears in the eyes of an Israeli father when they hear that their children have been harmed. The emptiness at the death that occurs in the Sudan is just as painful for those parents as it is for us. Hunger creates the same delirium in children in Darfar as it does right here in the state of South Carolina. Families living in substandard housing in Ecuador or Zimbabwe or Honduras are just as uncomfortable as the families in substandard housing that our Sakahatchee summer service workers work on right here in South Carolina. Because pain is pain and hurt is hurt all over the world. And intellectually, again, I know we understand this, yet few of us have entered into the pain of others who are different from us because we categorize people and we protect ourselves. 
which is one of the values of these mission trips. We open ourselves up to the potential of feeling that pain. Tagore, a poet in India, tells a memorable story about something that happened in his own life. His servant did not come in one morning, and like many professional men, Tagore was totally at a loss on how to do things to tidy up his own house or fix his own meals or do any of those daily chores that his servant did for him. An hour went by, and Tagore started getting very angry that his servant was still not there and had not called, and he started thinking of all the ways that he would punish his servant. Three hours later, when his servant still was not there, he no longer thought of punishment. Instead, he said, I'm just going to fire him. The minute he walks in here, I'm going to tell him he's good for nothing. I don't ever want to see him again. He needs to get out. Well, finally, the man showed up. And he didn't say a word to Tagore. He just started about his work, tidying up the house and fixing Tagore's meals. Tagore watched all of this, and he started fuming. He's like, how dare you just come in and not say I'm sorry and not tell me why you're late and just start working as if nothing has happened. He looked at his servant, and he said, stop it right now and get out of my house. You are fired. How dare you come in here so late and act as if nothing is wrong. The man was undeterred. He just kept sweeping and cleaning. And a few minutes later, he looked up. And with quiet dignity, he said, My daughter died last night. Pain is pain whether you're a servant or a renowned poet, whether you're rich or whether you're poor, whether you're a Jew or whether you're a Gentile, whether you're a Catholic or whether you're a Protestant, whatever it is that we divide among ourselves. And every time we exercise compassion, seeing people as people and recognizing pain as pain, we are exercising that courage to be last, to think of the needs of others before our own needs. Following Christ means that we have that mind of Christ, that we reach out to others. The late Charles Schultz, creator of the comic strip Peanuts, said the people who really make a difference in your life are not the ones with the most credentials, the most money, or the most awards. They're the ones who care and who show you that they care. It's hard work, my friends. And that's why we celebrate the courageous people in this congregation who served in Sakahatchee Summer Missions and those who went to Ecuador. They served with courage. And they served with the grace of God. Apostle Paul wants to remind us that above all the grace and the gifts that Christ gives to us is that ability to overcome our selfishness and to care for the needs of others, to recognize and to respond. May it be so for you and for me in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have a wonderful hymn to close our service today called The Summons, and it asks us several questions about following Christ. Are we ready to answer the summons to have the mind of Christ and to serve one another?